can't believe I'm saying this, but I've switched away from System D. I don't believe it. I'm just kidding. Hello, friends, and welcome into a very special Linux Unplugged. This is episode 314. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hello, Wes. Hello. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, because we've got a full house today. We do. It's a, it's a special week here at the Jupiter Broadcasting Studios. We have the full core team in-house. And I'll, I, I guess that's my quick way of saying people that are all involved in creating a brand new podcast for the network. What? are in-house this week, and that means that we have a whole cast of characters here helping us get various jobs done. So I want to say a very hello, happy hello to Mr. Achiz Abacon. Hello, Cheesy. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Good to have you here. It's Thank great you. to have everyone here. And hello to Alex. Nice to have you in studio, Alex. Howdy, y'all. Howdy, Alex. You're, oh, that's not, you're sounding good, sir. You sound, That sounded nearly real. Thank you. Nearly. Nearly. And it's always good to have Brent back in studio. Hello, Brent. Well, hello, everyone. How are you doing? I'm great. It's uh, good to be connected via real, like, uh, cords and stuff to the studio. That's nice. Brent made me breakfast. What? Mm-hmm. Brent made me He's breakfast such a today. gentleman. It's so good. And uh, Drew barbecued lunch, so. <laughs> Pays to have the team around. Now, of course, this wouldn't be a Linux Unplugged without our virtual lug time appropriate greetings there, Mumble Room. Hello. 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 It's really good Aloha. to hear- <laughs> Aloha, Neil. Aloha. Welcome back. Neil will be uh, giving us his flock report in a moment. But uh, Emma, I just have to say, it's super great to see you back. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I will be off crutches pretty soon, but I returned to System 76. Um, I've returned to the factory, so I'm moving around pretty good these days. Mm. Mm. Man, if people don't follow Emma Social Happiness on Twitter, she recently had a serious medical situation. Just, I mean, unbelievable to watch from afar, Emma. So It was a safari accident, to be specific. That is very cool. I, we should make that a disclaimer because, you know, other people get in, injured, but Emma got injured on a safari. So that's, that's true. But it's really good to see you back. Been following your journey on Twitter. Nice to see Thank you back you. at work. We have some cool stuff you and I are going to be talking about in a little bit today, too. So I'm glad you're here. But let's kick things off with uh, a wee bit of community news. Did you see all of this uh, hoopla around this uh, horrible bug that was discovered in KDE that uh, could uh, potentially uh, make it vulnerable to attack? Um, And then the uh, KDE project uh, responded by just ripping the feature out of Plasma, I understand. Yeah. What happened, Wes? So it's not, you can call it a bug or really it's a design decision because it turns out you can execute scripts in your .desktop or .directory files. And why would you want to do that? You know, the funny part is when they removed the functionality to do that, they, the words the company and the removal were, we didn't really have a use case. But you can imagine, <laughs> right, it's just like um, it's like a little hook you can run. You can run have a, a script. script to set up an environment ahead of time. I mean, I could kind yeah. of... I've co- never co- wanted to. Yeah, yeah. So that's funny. Mm. So they just ripped it out. Yeah. You know, there was a little kerfluffle here. Uh, DEF CON was going on, so the researcher disclosed it in a way that the KDE project was not too pleased about it because it just showed up on Twitter. And the researcher actually right. sort of stated that, well, DEF CON was coming up, and I just wanted to get this out there. Man, that shit really pisses me off. Like the, the one thing is when you're doing this is be responsible. Be responsible and work with the project. And going on Twitter just to uh, build your personal brand has got to be one of the worst human being things to do. Because not only uh, do you make a project look a little foolish because you don't give them the opportunity to work uh, with a heads up that just about everybody else gets— but you're putting real users at risk to make yourself look good. Yeah, there's just no point. It's I mean, disgusting. We, we could have got this solved and pushed out before anyone knew. Now, I, I doubt that this was being abused in the wild. It's not a super important vulnerability, but still. How do you think I got, have good form. How do you think I got that keylogger on your laptop? What? Yeah. Dang it. Yeah, we'll have links, though. You can go read the, uh, there is a little white paper about the vulnerability, and you can go see that, well, that feature, it's gone. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, we have perhaps the first modern core boot server platform. Supermicro's X11 SSHTF, I love the name because it's got SSH in it, uh, is a platform that supports core boot. This platform is the first modern upstream core boot server platform on the market with an Intel Xeon E3-1200 V6 processor, which uh, commonly known as the KB Lake DT. Now, Wes, you did a little uh, sleuthing into why Supermicro would be interested in doing this and sort of what the motivations are behind this development. It kind of checks out, kind of makes sense. Right. So um, this was over at the 9ESEC site. 
they've worked with Molvad, which is a VPN provider, and it's all part of the System Transparency Project. And basically the idea is to, you know, get as much of this stuff open sourced and transparent as you can, especially if you're interested as they are as a VPN provider of, you know, being able to guarantee things to their customers about how their systems run. And it's all well and good to have an OS that you can, you know, has audit logs and shows that you're not keeping other logs or exactly what you are keeping. But when you can't trust the firmware, you can't trust anything else. <laughs> so true. And you can see from a from like a marketing standpoint. This is a great thing to have on your site, fully audible platform from the VPN software all the way down to the core boot hardware of this system. And, I mean, as you've seen, if you've ever tried to use core boot, most of the time, anything that supports it is way out of date. But that's just not going to work if you're trying to run a business. Speaking of core boot, our friends over at System76 and Emma have a little news around core boot. It appears System76 is preparing to roll out their first core boot enabled Laptop, which is, uh, I think this news is coming out just ahead of this year's open source firmware conference. I bet those two things are not unrelated, Emma. It is exciting. And people that pre order with the open um, firmware will get to pick up their darters at the conference. Whoa, cool. Um, what kind of work has this taken behind the scenes to make this possible? Is there like some sort of a crazy mad scientist lab where uh, people are hacking away on firmwares? Has there been some sort of collaboration with another group? Like what What has been the engineering side of this? This has been in-house um, led by our, our lead engineer, Jeremy. Um, he's very big uh, into open firmware and developing in and, and Rust. And he's been putting it on all the laptops. Um, they've taken them apart if needed. They've had to work with Thunderbolt to get um, proper licensing to include in our core boot. We've had to work on suspend issues. Um, right now, the Darter and the Gazelle both are doing pretty good supporting Core Boot fully. So it's it's these two systems. Is it possible for existing purchasers, like people who have a Darter that maybe they got it six months ago, would it be possible for them to switch over to Core Boot and Linux Boot? Or is this only going to be the new systems? This should be anyone that, that currently has a Darter should be able to do it. And I'm guessing we'll have people reaching out and support if they want to um, implement that or test it out. And we'll be happy to give them instructions. So what's the uh, is the sales pitch now? Is it uh, is it user security and privacy? Like how does System76 look at this as a, like a, what, what, what is the value this adds to the product? Well, we want to make sure the entire product is open. So this this puts us a step closer to that, um, moving away from as much proprietary software as we can. Um, And this also lets us get to the lowest level of the hardware so we can maximize performance um, and just tailor the performance towards users' needs. I also noticed the brand new shiny 4K OLED display at our workstation was announced. And this... (laughs) This this thing um, is such a monster that we were speculating last week about what its capabilities were. And uh, sure enough, you guys said, well, why don't we send you out a test rig? Ooh. So in a couple of weeks, in a few weeks, we may have a review here of the new Adder workstation. What, what's your take on this new one? I bet you must be you must be pretty impressed. You've seen a lot of laptops come out the doors there. But this one's 4K OLED, RTX 2070 graphics, 8-core Intel i9, 64 gigs of RAM in a laptop. Yeah, she's a beauty. Um, If anyone picks her up, I'm guessing if you're a laptop namer, it's going to have some like sexy woman name. Yeah, it seems like a lady with that display. Beautiful eyes, you know. It's a beautiful eyes. Yeah. The um, contrast ratio is actually uh, 100,000 to one. Oh. So the contrast is pretty extreme. And um, it also has the nits. It's 400 nits. So it's pretty bright as well. That sounds wonderful. I think we've all been waiting for a laptop like that. I have a couple of different use cases. I want to bring it in uh, in house and uh, have it uh, see how it processes the drone footage because that's brought just about every machine down to its knees, uh, and then set it up as a, a VM machine. Maybe attempt to do some PCI pass through with it. With, when you're talking specs like this, yeah, we haven't tried the GPU pass through yet, but um, that is on the slate for this week for sure. Ooh, well, I'll let you know. Yeah, definitely one of the things I would like to test it out uh, and, and kind of run it through its paces would be just, you know, rendering out video, blender work, that sort of stuff. And, and I mean, they depict it here on the actual landing page for the site. So with that 2070 in there, I mean, you should really be able, in the mm-hmm. 4K display, you should really be able to get some high quality graphic and design mm-hmm. work done off of this machine. 
this will also be like one of my first longer term hands ons with uh, Pop OS. Right. Looking forward because I've been waiting. And then the last thing that I know, I I've, I've been looking at you know been looking at the specs of this machine. The one thing that I I really like so far, just from the outset, is a lot of the big bulky ports are on the back of the laptop. The power, the Ethernet, the HDMI, the Display Port, a USB A, NC. That works so well when you're just setting it it's up so on a mobile clean. desk. It's so yeah. clean. Yeah. So I'm 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 really looking forward to it, Emma. And I'm really glad you're able to make it back and chat with us about the news. It's great to see the core boot systems. So what's kind of the timeline for that to be just um the default when people order one of those machines? I don't have information on that yet. It's really hard to predict with um, NVIDIA models. Um, it's an ongoing project. Um, but I do need to mention one other thing. Um, the Adder is currently on sale for about another month. So if anyone is interested, we do have a 30-day return period. So now is the right time to purchase one. Okay. Also, kind of just saw this slip through the news, but it's probably worth mentioning too, is that it looks like System76 has been granted a Thunderbolt license. That seems huge. Yeah, that's that's for the core boot. So we can implement um, Thunderbolt functionality in core boot systems. That's fantastic. That was one of the lingering questions I had. That's great to see. Well, Emma, that looks like an awesome release. I can't wait to try it out and uh, kick the tires and uh, see if I can't make it suffer a little bit. <laughs> awesome. Well, we look forward to seeing what you think. Well, Emma, uh, do keep uh, checking in as you're feeling well. And... Uh, joining us because it's good to hear from you. We love to have you. Will do. Miss you guys. We miss missed you, you too. Glad to see you back. All right. Just a couple of items in the old housekeeping this week. This Friday stream will be the final Friday stream. Say it ain't As so. we say goodbye Ooh, to a crazy so experiment sad. that will result in a couple of new things that we're doing. So we looked at the Friday stream and said, how could we do this a little differently? And we decided to break it up a little bit. We'll have more information about that soon. Live stream, community, Q&As, things like that that'll be coming down the pipe. But the first takeaway is come see us on Friday because we have the crew in-house. This Friday, if you're listening the week this came out, we'll also release it, of course, over at FridayStream.com. It's going to just be a fun show with the crew in-house hanging out, and we're launching a brand new feed. We'll, we'll tell you all about this later on, but you can find it over at extras.show. Extras.show. All kinds of stuff will be ending up in, you know, stuff that maybe didn't fit in here, uh, an interview here and there, a random minimum viable podcast we're trying, extra content perhaps from today's episode of Linux Unplugged, things like that. That complete keynote from Thomas Cameron from oh, a couple of yeah. weeks back, that's in the extras feed. So we've created a new feed of extra content that doesn't quite fit in the other shows but we wanted something that you could subscribe to and just get it easily. Right. I mean, you know when you run out of JB shows, you're already caught up on everything for the week. <sighs> what are you going to do? Now we've got a feed for we you. We don't want you to get the shakes. Extras.show. That's with an S. Extras.show. And it's extras.show slash subscribe. It's just going to be fun, quick stuff in there that uh, gives us an excuse to kind of play around sometimes, including some stuff that we'll do on the live stream with the community very soon. So we'll tell you all about that. And a nice, nice bit of news on the Linux Academy core side, transcripts are nearly at 100% now. These are click-along transcripts that make it easy to jump around in the video. And there's a whole new batch of free courses that are available for community members if you sign up for Linux Academy community, including some cloud fundamentals, AWS security essentials. And Cali Deep Dive? A Cali Deep Dive. That's I know my you favorite. Wrote. That's worth going making the free account just for that right there. Tell you what. So... Check that out. That's all over at linuxacademy.com. You can sign up and get a free community account. L right here in our team curates that stuff. So that's why we mention it from time to time, because it's a good deal. So go check that out, won't you? And much, much more. And keep your ears out on that extras feed, because there'll be a lot of cool stuff coming down that feed. Extras.show slash subscribe for that feed. Now, Mr. Payne, there is a problem out there. And it's getting bigger and bigger That's by the, only the way day. It gets, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And thankfully, too. Otherwise, uh, Linux would probably be dead. We'd probably be, we'd probably be in a world of hurt. And a bunch of different communities are trying to solve this big problem that everyone listening to this show knows about. And that's the kernel is a huge project. It grows in size and contributors every single month. On average, most releases have somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 developers making contributions. Yeah, that's Major Hayden. He's a principal software engineer at Red Hat. And something on the order of two to 300 of those are brand new. Like they've never, 
uh, never made a contribution to the kernel before. He's going to be joining us in just a moment. And he's going to talk about a big project they're working on to try to solve this issue. Major's here to give us some background on this, and it's the Continuous Integration Project. It's a really cool idea to kind of try to catch the low-hanging fruit with how fast the Linux kernel is moving. There are some challenges there, and um, I would say Greg Crow Hartman's got a couple of really good talks on this particular topic. Um, one of the challenges, I guess the biggest challenge, is that it moves incredibly fast. Like, the project is large and moves fast. Uh, last I looked, it was the fastest moving open source project that was out there by a, a good amount, even way past Kubernetes. I think it does like, uh, if you take all the commits that have gone into Kubernetes, that's about two and a half versions of kernel development. So that's about two and a half releases wow. worth. So we're talking fast. Yeah, and so their idea here is, let's come up with something that can monitor this and send it out across multiple systems, architectures. Right, I mean, that's just a wide test base. The Linux kernel runs everywhere, as we say all the time, and that means you got to test it everywhere. And different, you have tons of different options when you're building it. Yeah, can you imagine doing this by hand? All right, I make a couple changes. I'm going to go compile that kernel. I'm going to go distribute it on like six different machines and architectures that I have to keep in my office to test this, (laughs) and then I'm going to test it, come back, wait, see if anything's changed and then repeat over and over and over again. That statistic, the Kubernetes entire product is two and a half kernel versions. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And you think of Kubernetes as this massive project, right? Yeah, there was just that review done of it this week, some security thing, uh, and it took them months. Yeah, and and then you have new contributors. You have subsystems that are on esoteric hardware. It's really a challenge. That's where this continuous integration project comes in. This project uh, uh, came about because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in the kernel. Uh, they can easily be tested. Um, there's quite a few things that you can test in a VM, uh, or you could test on a physical host, let's say, um, that are very easy to test, like internally with just that one machine. And so the question was asked, why don't we make automation that just runs these tests to catch the low hanging fruit? Cause the idea is we want to take Red Hat kernel developers and not have them go deal with these you know, like small, easy to fix problems that, that slow them down and make them have to go find a solution. But instead, let's catch these problems before the patch gets merged in the first place. So if someone says, you know, hey, I'm bringing in these 10 patches. And then we find that uh, when they do that, all of a sudden memory allocation issues pop up. Like you can't allocate memory like you could before or, um, you know, uh, it's just not structured in the way that you want to. Then you can call that out. Someone could say, you know, oh, there's a bug in there. Uh, the nice thing about that is you can find the bug right then when the patch is being proposed instead of later on when quality engineering is taking a look at a lot of changes, you know, not just the kernel, but a whole lot of things that are changing and trying to work backwards and figure out where the problem was. In our chat with Major, one of the things that he pointed out was that, okay, we can solve this from a technology standpoint, but there's the human factor as well. And there's a, there's a couple different projects, but the one that the Continuous Integration Project is working with to solve for the human factor is called, uh, was it Patchwork, Wes? Yeah, Patchwork. I mean, if you think about it, Linux kernel development is done in its own style. It's kind of an older style. You're on the mailing list. And while, of course, there's you know there are Git mirrors everywhere, it's kind of secondary. So you need to get the culture, understand how to interact with that, and you need a bridge to actually help the tooling work. There's a few software projects out that help with that. Uh, there's a big one called Patchwork, uh, and it essentially reads through uh, a mailing list uh, and watches the emails as they come in and tries to figure out which of these patches go together. So a kernel developer wow. might submit a patch and say, you know, okay, I, I want to change the way this works. Uh, it's, it takes 10 patches to make this change. And so they submit all 10 patches to the mailing list. Uh, and then what Patchwork will do is go and say, okay, wait a minute, this was... One contribution for one developer, it has 10 pieces. These go together. Uh, and so then inside the web interface, you you can go and look at all these patches together in one place. And, of course, there's an API as well. So if you have automation, you can actually just pull down the patches or what we call a patch series when Patchwork sticks them together uh, into one patch series. So that way you can test them. Uh, that way you can report back status on them and that kind of thing. But it's, it's a software project completely over on the side from the mailing list. Now, think about this for a moment. They thought they could replace 
all of this automated stuff, and they ended up running into this human problem where people have been doing it a certain way for a long time, have this that works for them. They got software that archives it. It's plain text. It's searchable. They got filters set up that have been working for them for years. It's part of a workflow. And you can't deny the kernel is successful, so obviously it must work. Yeah. And, I mean, you're not going to change that, right? I mean, that's established. So if you're going to build something to work with, it, that, that's your only option. Patchwork is an incredible effort to sort of solve a human problem and automate it at the same time. We'll have a link in the show notes if you want to know more about it. And if this, if you'd like us to dig into those kinds of projects, go to linuxunplugged.com slash contact. If you'd like us to deep dive into some of that stuff, you definitely can. Now, what's great is the way they're doing this, and even though it, it requires an incredible amount of infrastructure, they need system 390s, they need every various ARM system that's in production, they need lots of different Intel and AMD systems, the end result, hopefully is improvements upstream. And so as part of this, we ask the question, well, if, if we do this really well and we keep things from getting into the rail kernel that's not supposed to be there, what if we could do this for upstream? So what if we could do this for uh, an upstream kernel repository of some sort, sort and not only be able to catch it earlier, uh, but then catch it in a way such that we can help upstream development and help test uh, and help maintainers uh, actually know what's okay to go in the kernel and what's not. Okay, so how many software testers does it need to change a light bulb? None, because software testers don't make changes. They would just report that there's darkness. There are many, many different continuous integration projects. And uh, OpenQA is probably another very popular one. We'll have a link to a talk in the show notes. This talk is about OpenQA, the heart of OpenSUSE's automated testing. I'm Ludwig, um, I'm employed by SUSE and I was, and, and still I am, one of the engineers behind um, OpenK, where it is now. OpenSUSE is a huge project, um, and so they're one of many that take advantage of OpenQA. Yeah, I mean, think about it. it. It's just too complex to test by hand, right? There's too many little things that can change. You have a giant collection of software to handle. So solving that problem, they introduced OpenQA. One thing that's kind of neat about OpenQA is it replicates things the way a human might interact with, you know, simulated keyboard and mouse inputs. So you can test a huge range of software that might not be amenable to other testing methods. Yeah, and Fedora, as we've talked about before on the show, considers OpenQA a, quote, significant part of their release validation process. And that's one of the great things about open source, right? I mean, one distribution solves a problem, and another one can just take advantage of it. <laughs> no, it is. It is. Uh, and I wonder, uh, ladies and gentlemen... Mr. Popey is joining us now uh, mid-show. Popey, welcome to the Unplugged program. I know you've messed around with Jenkins a bit. Uh, is there any kind of continuous integration going on over at uh, Canonical for some of the projects there that you're aware of? Oh, my God, tons of it. Really? Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah. Uh, we use a little bit of Jenkins, and uh, we also use something called Spread, uh, which Spread does all the testing for SnapD across a whole bunch of different distros. Ooh. So we know that SnapD and Snaps work across different distros before we ship it. Of course, and this, it makes perfect sense in the Snap scenario. And don't we appreciate it? So you have... You, uh, you have uh, Essentially, VMs that are running the different distros that Snap could potentially run on, and then when a new builds out, it it deploys to those and tests to see if everything's working. Yep, does it for every pull request as well. <laughs> so the more active they are, the, the more busy. Yeah. the more of these machines get spun up. <laughs> yeah, they get busy. That's that's great. I noticed um, we had a pull request for the Caster Soundboard project on our Jupyter Broadcasting GitHub. Um, from the app image maintainer. And he said, you know, apply this patch to your project. And every time you do a build now, I'll just pull it down and I'll automatically build an app image of yeah. Caster Soundboard. Sweet. Gave us instructions to get it hooked up and then using Travis CI and I'll just sort of yeah. build it for us. Yeah, it's a Travis CI pipeline. And it's, um, it's a good example of how you can solve a problem like developing the Linux kernel <laughs> with this unbelievable amount of problem domain, or it can come all the way down to a simple open source soundboard that we use here in the network. Yeah, the same techniques work all over the place. Yeah, oh, it's it's really it's it's you got to solve these problems at machine speed. It's really what it is. We use um we use Travis a lot for a lot of the snaps we build, and at the recent Snapcraft Summit in um, Montreal, we had some guys from 
uh, Travis CI come along uh, because they want to streamline how they deliver software to the machines that are actually doing the builds because obviously they're spinning up thousands of these machines all day every day and you know it's very noticeable for them when Silicon Valley wakes up and everyone starts uh, committing the code that they've, they've made and all these Travis CI jobs start spinning up that's a lot of workload so they're they're constantly trying to optimize these machines to start as fast as possible and have all the compilers and and all the other build tools, the whole build chain in those machines as fast as possible. So they spin up and spin down super fast. It's <laughs> super fascinating stuff. It really is. Yeah. I would imagine it'd be the kind of thing that if I was still in IT, I'd probably be building. Probably the kind of things I'd be standing up now. Totally a tangent thing, but is it just me or or do you canonical folk have uh, a lot more of these uh, sprints these days? It seems like they went from a couple of times a year to um, all the t- I mean, one a quarter almost. Yeah, well, yeah. There is a lot of them, uh, but there's different types. We have engineering sprints, um, which we tend to have every six months, and roadmap sprints, which are every three months. And um, then the Snapcraft summits, which are like ad hoc. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a fair number of events going on at the moment. There's a lot of air travel and getting around. Yeah, it's good fun. Well, good. I'm glad you don't. I'm glad you don't mind. It can be fun, but you guys do. My, you tend to do them in pretty nice locations. I've been following along on Telecast for Popey recently. It's fun. It is <laughs> fun. Is there like a URL you give out for that that people? If we should give it out here on the show. Oh, that's very kind of you. Yeah, if you uh, you have to be uh, a, a Telegram user, a Telegram user. But what I did was I exported all of the episodes that I made out, and I've put them on my my website. So there's a recent tweet flow from me about this. Uh, but if you if you just go to t.me slash telecast with Popey, you'll get you'll get to the channel where all the Telegram uh, episodes are. Learn everything about beer and curry you ever wanted to know, <laughs> and more. <laughs> you had the most English telecast the other day where you were walking from home to the pub to get picked up by your <laughs> friends to go get curry and I just was oh, listening yeah. <laughs> it's so fun because it's like what at most like 7-10 minutes ever yeah. and sometimes much less so it's like who doesn't have time for that that's what I wanted it to be it's just like ad hoc just me having a little chat whatever's on my mind at the time but so I don't have to go through the whole episode, effort of creating an episode of something and publishing it somewhere and RSS feeds and all that nonsense I just press record in telegram and you know the thoughts come out of my brain out of my mouth and into the phone and i give it a preview list and then hit send and that's it i right. nothing more than that right. i think you're way ahead of us yeah well so now my my my, my last two questions are are you uh, are you going to be back on ubuntu podcast now that you're done traveling or is more traveling ahead so we just recorded two episodes before i get dropped in here so yeah i'm back on martin's out because he's on vacation so i'm back in and martin's out and i think in two weeks time we'll have our first one with all three of us back uh for a while and then last but not least um how how great is user air turning out did you have any idea how great this would be i see it's just like three guys chatting and i have no idea like I don't it's know, nice man. when you say when you say nice things, Chris. It's, I mean, when we get nice comments, we also get horrible comments. Of on, course, mostly on mostly on YouTube. From but can I just say you know people are listening? Can I just say not only have I been making podcasts for thirteen, fourteen years now, but I've been listening to them for just as long. And this is one of my favorite podcasts of all time. Oh, that's very kind of you to say. Joe, Joe, and Daniel put a lot of effort in. Oh, so, come yeah, it's on! Really it's always you. I'm nodding my head to. I'm always like, yeah, that's right, Poby. That's, <laughs> that's right. Because he's so reasonable. <laughs> He's well, and I've got kids like he does too. So it's like, yes, as Joe calls me, centrist dad. <laughs> my my wife referred to you the other day, Popey, as that guy who said something about bed sheets. Oh my god! It's also it's like the only show I get to listen to with my wife too. There's that, and I think a big part of what makes it work is Daniel Foray from Elementary is willing to take a bit of, as you would say, a piss. Like he'll just sit there and he'll just dig himself in deeper. <laughs> Take he'll, the piss, he'll Chris. take the piss. Not, what is it? Uh, I'm sorry. Hold on, hold on. Joe came in studio just to correct me. Hold yeah, on. Take the piss, not take a piss. <laughs> okay, thank you, Joe. Hello, Hello Joe. <laughs> Hello, Poppy. I'm going to go and wait for my pizza now. <laughs> Joe's here. We got all, it's a whole family reunion right now. We're working on a new super secret show, you know. So, oh. yeah. Yeah, very secret. So we, we've got we've got I, so seconds. secret. I even flew Drew, uh, Drew and uh, and uh, L and Joe, who haven't been on show. They're here too. So we've got in studio. Oh, wow. We've got Cheese and we've got Brent and we've got Alex and it's a whole JB party. Wes and myself, and we're working on some new secret stuff. 
It's very exciting. So one thing I would have to say is if any of the listeners want us to answer any particular question, they just have to let us know with hashtag ask error. Yeah. Uh, ping us in the, the JB telegram or in IRC, you know where to find it. Just ping any one of us with your crazy questions for us to ask about life, the universe and everything. They get some great questions. So whatever medium you like to talk to these guys, hashtag ask error, and uh, it'll show up on their radar, and then they ponder them in the show, and it leads to some of the best conversation and discussions. So, yeah. Well, Popey, it's good to have you here, and thanks for uh, giving us the canonical side of that. That's uh, it's an interesting perspective on how they use continuous integration. It makes total sense. Total sense for Snaps. Well, while we are talking about other great podcasts, you notice we don't do quite as many distro reviews. We still do a few. No, 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 no. We do like the big benchmark ones, yeah, right? The ones we can't not do. But if you want a review from folks who just can't seem to scratch that distro hop itch, check out Choose Linux. Here's a clip from each of them on the most recent distro they randomly tried, which is one I haven't given a go yet, Endless OS. I know that we start almost every single distro hop segment with, well, L, I see you had some issues, <laughs> but not this time. <laughs> this time, I'm in love. This is what I thought an operating system was supposed to be like. When people tell me about how they use Windows, and it's just simple, and you go and you use it. I would say that this is the prettiest GNOME retrofit that I've ever seen, too. It is almost on par with how good Deep In looks. I can see what you're getting at, El, but it's just too simple for me. Hmm, endless OS. Says the man who uses XFCE. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Also, shout out to XFCE Project, had a release this week. Shout out. Woo. That's Choose Linux. They, uh, they have, uh, they're also throwing in a few picks here and there. I don't know. I might just stop doing the show and just listen to them. Yeah, we can learn everything we need. Mm-hmm. Let's listen to them. All right, well, let's do our pick this week. Now, everybody's always talking about their tiling window managers. And I'm like, yeah, I know about your i3. Yeah, I know about your awesome. But I like me a traditional desktop environment. That's always been my go-to line. Well, Wes, today we are going to have our cake, and we are going to have it with a delicious side of ice cream. That sounds great. Yeah, right? It's called Quick Tile. Keyboard-driven window tiling for your existing window manager. I'm sorry, what did you say? Existing window manager. Hmm. Well, existing X11 window manager. So everybody's is. existing window manager. Hey, hey now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Like uh, in Choose Linux, they were reviewing OBS. And now it's like the reviews are getting to the point where you got to like start making the OBS disclaimer. Or, I mean, I'm sorry. When you're reviewing OBS, you got to like start making the Wayland disclaimer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like a lot of this stuff doesn't work because. Yeah. Or on I'm Wayland, like, it's just, oh, it's going to be hey, rough. We're getting there. We're all very hopeful about Pipewire. So what my plan is, is to just hang out on XFCE on X11 for a long time. And I'll just add a little window tiling key binding magic to my XFCE desktop. With QuickTile. Yeah, so that's where QuickTile comes in. It's an analog also to um, WinSplit. And uh, if you remember that, that was an old school. There was WinSplit and WinSplit Revolution, which were plugins for Compass. Now, if I... If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're... You got nothing. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about? Really? Oh, my nope. God. <laughs> oh, Wes, show them the wobbly windows real quick. Oh, uh, yeah, and I still got the... Uh, so, yeah, Brent, take a look. Tell me what you think about these wobbly windows. What do you think of that? Is that uh, fluff or is that fun? What do you think right there? Yeah. Or watch what happens when I close a window. Yeah, watch this. Watch this. Come on now, Wes. Now, okay. Honest, your first impression. Okay, the wobbly windows, I think, is super fun. It sparks joy. Oh, yeah. yeah I can't it? stop smiling. You're seeing it. I'm, I can't stop smiling. So... um. I will say I'm a fan of that. The exploding windows, I don't know. Yeah. It felt a little cheesy. But imagine like you're angry and you want to close something. Ah, and yeah. you just explode it. You know I what was it. even better is back in the day they had burn down windows. You close it and it would fire effect and it would burn down. I'd be okay with like the turning the old CRT TVs off. Yeah. I'd oh. Like that. that would be great. In Plasma, one of the fun things you can do is you can set it so that your, uh, your windows gray out when the application crashes. Which is kind of a neat effect. I think I have that in Plasma. Yeah, yeah. yeah you set great. that up? Oh, yeah. yeah. So no, you no, could, I didn't set it you up. You could turn on the wobbly windows. Oh. Yeah, it's Careful. just under desktop effects. I mean, you got, you got awesome. that GPU sitting there doing nothing, right? Most of the time. I mean, all those engineers work to build that GPU for something. Might as well put it to the... I don't even notice anymore. I kind of like, I feel bad showing it because the wobble doesn't seem like it's very wobbly anymore. No, you could up the wobble if you want. Oh, of course, it's right. Plasma, so you could increase the wobble factor if you... 
if you want to increase the wobble factor. Poby will not be increasing the wobble factor because uh, he did something that is so 2019 Linux personality that I just, I, I, I love and also Uh-oh. fully appreciate. So uh, on Twitter, I which God only knows why he chose to do this, he announced that he was switching away from Plasma. And then was it six successive tweets explaining how <laughs> it's okay that you're switching away from Plasma and that everybody else's choices are okay too? Yeah. I don't like this whole, you know, internet Z-list celebrity has switched from distro A to distro B, the sky is falling rubbish. So I just had to super clarify everything in a complete succession of tweets. I liked it, though, because you referenced back the first tweet of when you actually installed KDE Neon. Um, And what are you on now? Are you just on mainline uh, Ubuntu? Yeah, Ubuntu 1904. Uh, with GNOME, what was the uh, was it just time for just trying something else, or what was the uh, what was the impetus? Do you know the actual trigger to this was last week's LUP? Oh, really? When you uh, I I I came in and my audio was all messed up, oh, and I've yeah. tried so many things and I couldn't figure out what the hell it was. So I thought, okay, there's got to be something fundamental on my system. I don't know what it is, and I don't know who to file a bug against or what project to file a bug against. So I I decided right let's just upgrade to the latest of everything and if it still happens then then i can start looking for where the bug is mm-hmm. and it hasn't happened yet i don't think which is partly why i'm here to like test that this this actually works i'm wondering if your impression not even necessarily from like a technical level but just my impression is the gnome audio stack just seems a little simpler like it just seems like it's sitting right on top of pulse and whatever pulse is doing that's what gnome's doing well, I think part of it is that KDE gives you knobs and buttons to, to, to switch. So Plasma gives you like things you can tweak. And because the GNOME desktop doesn't, uh, it's, it's harder to shoot yourself in the foot. And I think it's entirely possible that I've twiddled something in KDE at some point in the last 18 months, which has made this go bad. And I don't know what that is. That's possible. But there are lots of other possibilities as well. Hardware failure, it could be Pulse Audio is rubbish. There, there's so many things. I don't. I can't point the finger at any one thing. But yeah, the audio subsystem on GNOME seems to be simpler. You sound great today. Awesome. Thank so you. you go. That's what matters. I can't suppose. argue with that. Yeah, I, I find that um, I find that I hop about every nine months now. It's about my yeah. It's the problem to- when all the options are so good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all good. We're going to do some reloading here in the studio. In fact, we were thinking about having an on-air debate about what we reload to. I'm becoming um, less and less attracted to nuking and paving a system. Mm-hmm. So I built an Arch system a year, a year ago. It turned one year old on July 27th. And I've got it set up just the way I like it. And I, I don't know if this is just because I've now been using Linux for long enough that I can actually troubleshoot my problems sufficiently that nuking and paving is no longer a requirement to get a stable system or whether it's just because I've become so comfortable in this pair of old worn out comfy shoes that now it's like um, I don't I just don't feel the desire to nuke and pave like I used to I mean I have a, a Proxmox server in my basement that I can just spin stuff up on and my laptop and my desktop are, are work horses now and they just need to work true there is an element of you know you you have to know enough about a system because half, half the three kicks that happen on our team are we, we did something weird and we got to start again. And if you keep doing it every time, you don't ever quite learn what it was that broke it. But you always have to do that math like, ah, my time is worth X, Y, Z. Exactly. I know it'll take me two hours to re-kick this thing. I know it'll take me five hours to troubleshoot it ish or, in, or more. Amount yeah, of time. exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, but Popey said something in one of his recent uh, telecasts with Popey that I had to respond back because he said some, I can't, probably we were talking about upgrades and how people are always like, we almost have like a wipe and pave or a nuke and pave culture that just sort of is the default answer. And it's yeah. not necessarily always the best way to go. Sometimes just upgrading for a while actually is the best way. Yeah. I, I've long lamented the fact that, um, that people will say don't upgrade because upgrades are broken and therefore you should always do a clean install. And I appreciate, you know, sometimes they are broken. And part of the, the, the problem here is that people do all kinds of crazy things to their machines 
and then forget they've ever done that. And then six months later, they go to upgrade and something they've, de- they've done is so fundamental that the upgrade breaks. Now, part of that is they then blame us, the, the, the <laughs> distro maintainer, yeah. because we make a shonky distro that can't upgrade properly. Yet they ripped out core components of the desktop six months ago, but they don't remember because this was just a command they copy and pasted off of a blog somewhere in order to get a new theme or to get a new splash screen in yeah, Grub. Right? Disable system D or something stupid. Or, or yeah, something <laughs> ludicrous like that. But they don't know they did it. Did you hear that I've switched from system D? It's great. <laughs> Troll. <laughs> yeah. But but part of the problem is us in that when we leave people in a really horrible state, when an upgrade breaks, you're left with often a black screen or no way to log in. Or if you do log in, your desktop doesn't load properly or something. And that's horrible. And when you're in that state as a user, what are you going to do? You're going to nuke and pave. And then you're going to get it in your head that that's the right way to upgrade. And so it becomes ingrained behavior. And see, for me, this is one of the big advantages of of building an Archbox, is I know every command that went into building that thing, and I had to go and learn why I'm running that particular command. Whereas, as you say, copying and pasting something to piping it to shell is is very easy and tempting, but it can lead to problems down the road that you just don't foresee because you don't you don't understand what it is you did. I mean, I love Arch, so don't get me wrong, but uh, here's the context for the rest of the audience. Uh, before the show, we were discussing what OS we're going to deploy in the studio after today's show. We have a couple of things we just need to address. Um, some of these ma- machines were either set up as Kubuntu or Neon, and now they're running XFCE, and we just want to do a clean install, so it's just a base system. Start fresh. Start fresh. Um, and we want to do it before there's a lot of issues. There's a couple of niggly things we've noticed. And then, of course, because it's a group full of Linux geeks, the debate of what distro we should use has been the number <laughs> one. This oh, yeah. <laughs> I know it really is the serious like, point of contention. Um, so Alex is advocating for Arch. Drew is essentially advocating for Ubuntu LTS. And I'm on the fence leaning towards Fedora. Um, you say that, but you, you want Fedora. You'll yeah. be happy to see Fedora chosen. Yeah, I would be. I would be. More Ubuntu. So um, I'm I'm gonna make my I'll start I'll make my so Alex just made his case for Arch I will I will counter that with we started with Arch <laughs> we started with Arch and now here we are can I may I add that um, one of the additional problems that I that, that I doubt Alex has that we would have in the studio is you like to do upgrades immediately before live shows because that's when you're here in the studio working on the machine. There is a little bit of that, and and it's fine. Like most, you know, when you do the upgrades, when you have time and a safe space, Arch is fine. It's very stable. I've stopped doing that. Okay, if but, you say so. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you got right. it. Okay, maybe I haven't completely one hundred percent stopped, but I've reduced. <laughs> I, I want this to be a soundboard clip. That, I've, I've moderated. <laughs> that three seconds was amazing. <laughs> um, no, I think for me, it's like I've always felt like a little bit of like spitting into the wind, but it it is also like me saying my operating system should be able to handle this, like. Um, so you probably saw this week that uh, Canonical announced that the absolute latest and greatest version of Ubuntu LTS now has like a nice GUI way to sign up for the live patch service. Yeah, get yourself an Ubuntu One account, and then you can patch three machines for free, and you can do it all through the GUI, and then you're secure through reboots for some of the more uh, important ones. That's super appealing to me in a studio environment. And so initially I envisioned like deploying Ubuntu LTS everywhere, bringing it all into landscape, using live patch to manage them. And then I started having sound problems, which we've documented. And we've resolved for the most case by switching up to Jack. It's pretty much solved our problems. But now I now we're sitting here with these systems that are sort of Frankenstein. And I've I've had a lot of experience in the last nine months. I don't know how long has it been. Yeah, yeah, six better nine months this, this year. You've been yeah messing with Fedora, and it seems like a very clean, reliable system that has good, solid upgrades. Uh, and Drew himself has some yeah, good experience with doesn't it. Doesn't hurt that and our you, editor be, loves it. And between the two of you, like we can pretty much pull anything off with Jack Audio. So I kind of feel like maybe it's time to just switch to Fedora, and then we have Fedora on the server and on the systems. 
And that's the part that appeals to me the most is one common OS, one common environment. The server's running Fedora, my laptop's running Fedora, the studio systems are running Fedora. Everything is the same environment. Yeah. And you are, I mean, you're kind of the, the primary admin. You're here in the studio the most. You're using the machines the most. So that's not for nothing. Right. But I don't want to do it at the expense of software availability or reduced production quality. And so that's where I wonder if Drew has a case for Ubuntu LTS. So I do. Uh, but I before I get to that case, I will say I am already uh, maintaining a group of packages that do what we need it to do for my own use because I use Fedora on my workstations as well. I know. That's why I think it's so, funny that you're going to come in here and advocate for Ubuntu. So I would be comfortable with the studio having Fedora. To me, it, it does make sense. What I like about Ubuntu LTS <laughs> is the um, long-standing nature of it. Fedora 30 is going to be supported until, what, two years after release, right? So, And we'd probably bump up to 31 after that arrives. And there's just, it's, it's a lot of upgrading and it is targeting a use case that is more agile than a production machine like a recording studio to me should be. I will grant you uh, uh, going Fedora is conceding that we are getting on an upgrade tread machine. Yes. Yes. So that is why I think the Ubuntu LTS route is probably the better route for a production machine. Workstations those can be great and agile, and that's what I do at home. But if you want something to be fairly static and work the same way every time, an LTS is kind of the, to me, it's the right way to go. And the Ubuntu Studio repositories are fantastic. They have everything that I put in my Fedora repositories mm, already in there. Mm, so yeah. really, how, how do people find that repo? Uh, if you just do a search on uh, the Fedora copper for Drew of Doom or Linux Pro Audio, they'll find it. Because it's actually really nice. Some of those tools have not been on Fedora before this, so it's actually really nice that you're doing that. Um, so, Wes, here's my argument. My counter-argument, because everything everything Drew said, can't, can't argue with that. No, Absolutely solid, especially when you add the fact that we could use live patch so we could actually even keep the system secure without having to reboot them. That's super attractive. Uh, and I would only need, like, these three systems. It doesn't need to be more than that. But... You're working on Jack in the Box, which is a project to take a lot of the audio routing and put it inside a Docker container and sort of normalize the desktop and the OS. And if we were to roll out something like that, it wouldn't really matter. Yeah, I mean, that is kind of the flip side of we could adopt Ubuntu LTS, but eventually we will have to upgrade. And that's a long, it's going to be a long time, possibly. That's good and bad. Um, if we do go with Fedora, we're going to get a lot of practice following the upgrade path. Well, and then also I think we could probably take advantage more quickly of things like Pipewire as well. Right. So I think it's kind of the, the difference between what Drew's suggesting and making them really appliances, like things we'd be, you know, you find in a rack you don't futz with. Right. And as much as we do use these as a production machine, they're also content sometimes. And, you know, we are still adapting our our pipeline, how we do the shows, and we probably are going to continue doing that for a while. Part of me wants to use these shows as a way to push forward the most modern way to develop audio. Right. And, like, we're doing some super freaking cool stuff with Linux Audio right now. Um, I, Alex, I know you want to jump in. I want to give you a chance. Yeah, I do. So I, um, I've been looking in the Fedora Project org website whilst you've been talking and the average lifespan of a fedora release hovers around the shortest is 330 days so just under a year the longest is 420 days and that was fedora 22 but on average it seems to hover around that 380 mark so you you are, you know, signing up to get on this train of upgrading at least every 9 months yeah. by the looks of it i that's what i estimate and that's too. my biggest concern really is that having to upgrade it could be a really inconvenient time because these releases come they say every six months with fedora but they also have a big disclaimer underneath that says it'll be approximately six months depending it'll be done when it's done is the disclaimer so it could end up shifting slightly so it won't be like okay it's may linux fest northwest is out of the way we can safely upgrade this box now you might end up having to wait a bit and so i mean for me a rolling distro uh you never really have to worry about that kind of stuff I can also see where Drew's coming from, though, with the LTS being a minimum to probably four years worth of 
updates and stuff. I mean, for me, I'd probably go that route, right? I mean, yeah, 1804 is really in that sweet spot right mm-hmm. now. It's really good. And, you know, one other option that hasn't been floated, CentOS. If you're doing everything in a container, it doesn't doesn't make it. You're not giving up what you know. The thing Chris said, he doesn't want to give up software availability. If you're doing it on CentOS and everything's in a container, then part of me feels like I'm like not participating. Like I'm watching Linux on the on the in, from the benches. If I if I'm using CentOS, CentOS yeah. <laughs> you have a laptop for that. You have. I know right. these are production machines that just need to work. I have a proposition for you, Chris. How about you do whatever it is you're going to do now. And then you'll get it out of your system, and then in nine months' time, switch to 2004 LTS, where you can have ZFS en route, and then you can do snapshots before you do your upgrades, and then you won't have to worry about it. There you go. Oh, wow. he, has a, he has a point there. It's very point. logical. It's very, that is, uh, as, as the good Mr. Spock would say, logical. I guess I'm struggling to come up with a reason now. Uh, I think we've made a good case for the LTS, especially since the package availability is there from the uh, other flavors. I guess what would you propose is our solution then for the variance between production and workstations? I mean, we work for a company called Linux Academy, right? (laughs) I think it's... You think think we can solve that problem? I think it's a good thing to be familiar with multiple different flavors of Linux. You're right. I, You're right. You know, I mean, right. as, as host of Choose Linux, I ought to be right. But um, yeah, no, it's I don't I don't see any reason to pigeonhole ourselves into saying uh, we run Fedora only mm-hmm. or we run Ubuntu only or any. I to me, I like being familiar with multiple different systems, and yeah. I feel comfortable administrating them all. All right, so, so let, let's do it then. Let's do. Uh, I think we should do Ubuntu. Yeah. 1804 LTS right here. That'll be what we reload the system to. We we just got to make sure we make sure it's decent because like there's some some XFCE going on right now mm. and some of the window management it's just it's kind of bare bones. What are you proposing something else? No, not necessarily. I'm just saying you know we want to make sure it's a he wants easy those wobbly windows. Wow, that wouldn't hurt. Can I can I tell you about our <laughs> app? Oh, okay, we got to make sure we install a dock. We what about QuickTile? Sure. What about using QuickTile? Yeah, you know it is also um, Python, so we could probably script it too. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can. Oh absolutely. Um, yeah, you've you've whipped together a couple of uh, hacks using XRander, which has been helpful. We could expand on that. But you're right. XFCE does lack some modern window rules and stuff like that that are super nice in Plasma. We just, I'm just saying we just we should think about those things as we go forward. Thankfully, on the LTS, it really doesn't matter what base distribution you're we just choose, coming, right? We can mix here, it up and install it. Wes, Wesley, Wesley Payne, you're coming That's at me. me. You're coming at me with questions, not solutions right now. I mean, you're, to me, you're just, I don't know what you mean. You mean, do we can't use Ubuntu? Like, my head's spinning now. Like, my whole world is falling no, apart. No, I just want you to trick it out for me. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Adopting a distro like a religion is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Thanks. Very well. So said. what are your feelings on the current iteration of Ubuntu with GNOME as the default. Like, How do you feel about GNOME these days? Because I know you've had a... Actually, I think GNOME looks great. You know, um, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but one of our team members here is trying it out, and I was looking over his or her shoulder, and uh, gosh, it looks so good. You know, it just looks so good. It's just a, not what I need for production appliance systems. Um, I actually would prefer nothing has a... Comp- I, no compositor, no no special 3D effects, no nothing. I3 then. <sighs> All right. It. All right. Oof. <laughs> Chase, did you hear what he just said? He said I3 on a production machine. I'm glad you guys, I just was just li- listening to all you guys hash it out. But the reality is, is that Drew is right, is that you should use the LTS because... Maybe we should do I3. term support, fellas. Hey, what do you think? Maybe, we, should we give ZFS? I3 a go? Yeah, if you're down, let's do it. I mean, let's, I3 is great. Let's yeah. give it a go, and then we'll say, we'll, we'll give it a review in next week. Do you, want, you want to put a cheat sheet on the wall next to you? Though? Yeah, okay. All right, good call. <laughs> cheat sheet. All right, okay. All right, well, we'll see how that goes. So make sure you tune back next Tuesday. You can join us live over at jblive.tv. Get it converted at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. And see you next Tuesday.
if you're, and you know who you are, if you're somebody who doesn't want to mess with the, I just want to surf, the, I just want to buy something on Amazon, send an email to my kids, look at some websites. If you, if, you, if that's you, you don't want to mess with it, probably not a good choice. What was that hesitation before? Look at some, mm, some <laughs> You know websites. what's funny is Leo actually now is, he's a pretty happy desktop Linux user. Yeah, that's what I hear. Neil, how was Flock? It was awesome. Uh, aside from being in, in Hungary, which I've never been to before, which was it was an experience in itself. It was great meeting all these people again for an, another year and seeing a bunch of new faces, too. Now, this is the old uh, Fedora Developers Conference. And did you did you get anything accomplished? Did you achieve any kind of kumbaya on anything that you set out for? Like, uh, how was that aspect of it? Uh, so from my point of view, the big thing was uh, I wanted to see, you know, w- how the relationship between the new RHEL, RHEL 8, and Fedora is going to work out and, like, talk with some of the people about so the extra packages for enterprise Linux for uh, for RHEL 8, uh, as well as the Fedora modularity thing and its downstream RHEL cousin, um, the application stream stuff. Uh, so that was that was a big chunk of what I was looking toward. Um, but there was also some great things about uh, how we're going to handle some of the changes in the Python ecosystem. You already know from my previous times being on Linux Unplugged, talking about murdering Python 2 in its sleep. Uh, so there there was that as well as looking forward to the future of where, you know, in the Python ecosystem is evolving the way that software is developed and shipped and things like that and stuff like you know, getting into weeds of it, things like dist utils and setup tools, if you're familiar with Python development, have been the staple or nearly the requirement for everything. That's going away as a requirement. And that requires, that means that a lot of things about how we assume Python software is shipped has to change. And wait, I've, wait the most important part. Mm-hmm. Did you get sick? No. Yay. Congrats. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, Glad congratulations. Congratulations. That's woo. moving on up, Neil. <laughs> next, your next level conferencing now, Neil. That's what that means. <laughs>